In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For the Word of God is living and active. sharper than any two-edged sword. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Is not my word like fire, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How's everybody doing? We're good. I'm excited you're here tonight. Thanks for coming back. We've got one more night. Uh, last week, we went through 39 books and thousands of years of history. Tonight, we will do 27 books, and um, we'll uh, hit 100 years of history and, um, and probably still be cutting it very close to do two hours. So, Let's jump in. When we left last week, the end of the Old Testament, we closed the pages. Uh, right after the prophet Malachi, the people had been in exile. Uh, many of them are coming back from exile, but they're also bringing new customs, new traditions, new perspectives with them. Not only that, some of the people of God were staying in exile, like a Nehemiah or an Esther who would maybe come and go. But during the exile, they lost the centrality of the religious system in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was no longer the capital. It was no longer the epicenter of religious worship and religious thinking uh, because they weren't geographically in proximity. So in exile, uh, we see the rise of the synagogue and the rabbinical system. So synagogues would rise up. Um, it would be small communities of, of Jewish people that would meet together to study uh, the law and to work worship God together. Rabbis were men who would interpret scripture. They would have followers called disciples, and you would see different schools of thought emerge, different ways of interpreting the scripture. Um, one of the things that we talked about on the first night is that between the time of Abraham and David, there were a thousand years. And between the time of David and Jesus, there was another thousand years. And the way the Jewish people thought about their faith, the way they practiced it, the way they understood, the way they were supposed to relate to God, shifted during that time. And so by the time Jesus comes on the scene, there's been another many actually massive shifts. So we're back in, Jer the people are back in the land. Jerusalem is once again the, the capital of, um, of their, their land. It is the epicenter of religious activity, but now they're living under Roman occupation. So after the exile, we talked about this last week in 330 BC, Alexander the Great conquers the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire is now uh, on the scene. And then in 63 uh, BC, we have the Roman Empire uh, step into uh, human history as the major power of the day. And so the people of God are back in their land, but they're living under occupation. Um, there, were, uh, there were four primary types of Jewish people. Uh, four primary streams of how they understood their faith and practiced their faith. There were the Pharisees, the ones you probably heard most often about because they are featured a lot in the New Testament and the Gospels. Uh, the Pharisees were, uh, were very devout. They practiced spiritual disciplines. They were committed to prayer prayer. 
to fasting, to the Word of God, to studying the Word of God, to understanding the Word of God, to applying the Word of God, and they were very, very popular in culture. They were very well-liked. So those are the Pharisees, devoted to God's teaching, to his ways, and wanting to live a life of holiness. Then there were the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the uh, aristocratic ruling classes who controlled the priesthood in the temple. Um, They had learned to get along well with whatever occupying power was in place. And because of this, they were profiting off the Roman Empire. In many ways, they were kind of traitors to their own people, even though they were the religious leaders. There have been excavations in the city of Jerusalem. You can go visit them. It's like a a tourist attraction. You can go down into a house that has been excavated, and it is believed to be the house of the high priest. It is massive. It was opulent. It was extravagant. The Sadducees embraced the first five books of the Old Testament, but unlike the Pharisees, they did not embrace the writings and the prophets. So the Pharisees were well respected, the Sadducees were well off, and then there were the Essenes. The Essenes decided that the best way to approach holiness was to separate themselves entirely from culture. So they were kind of let well enough alone. Uh, They would form little monastic-like communities out in the desert. In fact, I've got a picture of one in Qumran, uh, actually where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. So that little cave right up there, which is actually pretty high up, is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and those were writings uh, of the Essene community. The Essenes believed we've got to separate from culture, not have anything to do with it, and uh, they kind of developed their own rites um, of religious worship. And then finally, there were the zealots. The zealots expressed their faith in very militant ways. The zealots believed that the way that we will step into the kingdom of God, the way that we will once again experience our freedom, is by fighting back, by using military might, by using violence to bring the kingdom, to bring God's promises to pass. Now, sometimes, well, often, we make the mistake of thinking Jesus just kind of showed up already a fully formed person with fully formed ideas um, and, and just kind of started introducing some new teaching. But the reality is Jesus was fully man. One of the things that we wrestle with in theology is that Jesus was both fully man and fully God. And so in his full humanness, he was born as a baby to a young Jewish girl. He grew up going to Jewish religious schools and being taught. Now, in most cases, um, he would be taught, a Jewish boy would be taught by his dad. His earliest religious education would come from his dad. So Jesus grew up in a certain stream of culture. He didn't just pop out of heaven with a Superman cape ready to go. He grew up in a certain stream of thought. So if we ask the question, what stream of thought, what stream of faith, what denomination did Jesus grow up in? Was it Pharisee? Was it Sadducee, Essene, or a zealot? And it's almost by process of elimination that we come up with the fact that, well, he obviously wasn't a zealot, and they weren't rich people, so he wasn't a Sadducee. And they didn't live out in the desert somewhere separated from the rest of the community. So he wasn't an Essene. He must have been a Pharisee. And this hits us as very strange because we always understand that the enemies of Jesus were Pharisees. And yet I would encourage you to read the Gospels very closely because most often the arguments between Jesus and the Pharisees or about lifestyle and interpretation. And when you read them without the filter of Jesus good, Pharisee bad, you realize that these are kind of like family fights. The real enemies of Jesus were not the Pharisees. I would argue the enemies of Jesus were the Sadducees. The Pharisees disagreed with Jesus. There was lots of good debate. 
and sometimes it even seemed very pointed and very um, conflict-heavy. And yet at the end of the day, it was not the Pharisees who put Jesus into enemy hands. Their disagreements were about doctrine and lifestyle and interpretation, never about whether or not Jesus should be crucified on a cross. Um, the life of Jesus is recorded in four different books, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the gospel writers. These are basically biographies of Jesus, and they all have slightly different twists to them. So Mark, it is most often was, uh, is believed to have been written first, maybe sometime around 58 AD. It is the shortest of the gospels. Uh, one third of the book is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life. You see the word immediately over and over and over again in the book of Mark. It moves very quickly. It was written with a Roman audience in mind. Get to the point quickly, show Jesus as a man of action. Mark was not one of the original 12 disciples, but he was a disciple of Peter, and he was a cousin of uh, Barnabas, and he also went along with Paul on at least one of his missionary journeys, and so he had great uh, access to firsthand accounts. Luke was probably written next around, six, uh, uh, around 58 AD, sorry, Mark may have been 55. Luke 58, although some believe that Luke was written first, there's kind of a debate. Some people believe that Mark borrowed from Luke and others believe that Luke borrowed from Mark. Luke was a medical doctor who was a companion of Paul on his missionary journey, so he also was not one of the original 12 disciples, but says that he wrote his, um, his uh, uh, writings about Jesus after careful investigation. He interviewed a lot of people. He interviewed people that had firsthand eyewitness accounts. He highlights Jesus' compassion to the poor, his ministry to women. Um, he, can, he includes in his writings six miracles and 19 parables that aren't included in the other writings. Then you've got the Gospel of Matthew that was written by one of the 12 disciples, Matthew the tax collector. He was writing his book primarily for a Jewish audience. Unlike the other uh, Gospels, he quotes extensively from the Old Testament. And it's as though he's showing that the prophecies and the writings of the Old Testament are pointing to Jesus and making that connection for his Jewish audience. Um, and then finally, you have the Gospel of John, also one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, likely written much, much later, around 90 AD. And John's Gospel is very different. Where Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of follow the same chronological order, you can find the same stories in kind of the same place, uh, and, and it tells one kind of same chronological story. John has a lot of teachings and miracles and events that aren't recorded in the other three books, and he also has some things that are seemingly out of order. For some people, this raises concerns about accuracy. For me, I'm just reminded that these writers are human beings that may have different um, goals in mind with their writing. I believe that instead of giving us a newsworthy account of the details of Jesus' chronological life, John was trying to teach us theological truth about who Jesus was. So for instance, there is a moment where Jesus goes into the temple and throws a fit and clears out the money changers and says, this is my father's house, it's a house of prayer for all people. That event is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke at the end of Jesus' ministry. It's recorded there at the end of his time when he goes into Jerusalem right before the crucifixion. That's when they place that event. John, on the other hand, puts that event at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now, some scholars would say, well, maybe he did it twice, once at the beginning, once at the end. What a great way to bookend uh, his ministry by throwing a fit in the temple and, and making a statement about who God is and who he's for. Or John may just be making a point, giving us a window into what Jesus had come to do which was to turn the world upside down. Another difference is in the crucifixion story. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when we read Jesus is having dinner with his disciples, that last, the, the last supper with his disciples before going to the cross, they set that meal as the Passover meal. As in Jesus is the host of the meal, has gone to the temple and sacrificed the lamb and brought it and is serving it to his disciples as the Passover meal. 
John has a slightly different chronology. In John's gospel, Jesus is being physically nailed to the cross as the lambs are being slaughtered in the temple. Again, I don't think John had his chronology wrong. I think he is making a larger theological commentary on Jesus. For John, the important message was not the details or the order, but rather what we are learning about Jesus. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Again, it's kind of interesting to read them in parallel and read them side by side. And then John just gives us a little bit different view. Uh, we begin the story in the book of Matthew with a genealogy. This is the part of the Bible that we just like skip over because it's a lot of names that we can't pronounce and we don't know how to spell. But the reality is this genealogy, I mean, it's like the worst way to start a book, right? Like you never start a book with a bunch of boring details like a bunch of names. And yet that's how Matthew starts his account. But he does it to draw a line from Jesus back to David to show that he is the Messiah. He's building his case that Jesus is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. What's fascinating about the genealogy of Jesus is that five women's names are listed. At that time in history, women were not included in genealogies, but Matthew includes five. One is Tamar who pretended to be a prostitute, slept with her father-in-law. We didn't even talk about that story last week. Uh, another one was Rahab, um, the woman who committed adultery with uh, King David. I'm, I'm sorry, no, the prostitute um, that had the brothel on the Jericho wall uh, when the uh, children of Israel marched around the wall. Um, it includes Bathsheba, who was the one uh, with David. Ruth, the Moabite woman who uh, stuck with her uh, mother-in-law, Naomi. And then finally, Mary. And what's interesting about those first four women is that it shows that it doesn't really matter what you've done or who you are or what your background is. God has a place for you in his story. Like, not only did Matthew include women, but it was almost like in some ways he's, he's scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of morality, and he's also including women that were not Jewish. They were Moabites. They were some other uh, nationality. They were part of the, the, the Canaanite people in Jericho. But God is saying, my story transcends this one specific culture, and I've come for all people. It's echoing back to Genesis 12 when God said to Abraham, I will bless every nation through you. So then we find out that this angel, uh, Gabriel, appears to three people, to Zechariah, uh, and tells Zechariah and Elizabeth, in your old age, you're going to have a baby. Appears to Mary, who is a virgin. She's probably a teenager. She is not yet married, and the angel says, you're going to have a baby. And, um, and then if I were Mary, my one request would be, could you let Joseph know? Which eventually the angel did let Joseph know, but it wasn't until much, much later. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then we get into the birth narratives of Jesus. They're found in Matthew and they're found in Luke. Um, I want to kind of zoom out for a moment and talk a little bit about the nativity story as we often think about it, celebrate it, decorate it. So there's usually this kind of stable structure with the manger, which would have been a stone feeding trough for animals. Um, and then you know, some animals around, and Mary and Joseph, and then some shepherds, and three wise men, and angels, and m maybe a little drummer boy or something. And I want, I want, again, for us to think about the story of the birth of Christ in its original historical cultural context. I would also challenge you to go back and read the actual accounts to figure out what it actually says and what it doesn't say. Because we have interpreted or we have read in certain things to the Christmas story that may come from a Western culture mindset lens than what actually happened in the biblical account. So the first thing I want to bring up, and it's kind of the low-hanging fruit, is that we assume there were three wise men. All we're told is that there were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There could have been two wise men. There could have been 50. Um, 
my husband Ryan, we we send epiphany cards instead of Christmas cards. One because we can't get our act together by Christmas, um, but also we love the feast of Epiphany, which is the appearing of Jesus as the celebration of the Magi coming. And um, every year Ryan wants to do a card that actually has five wise men on it, with one of them saying, "Oh, you brought gold too," and the another one saying, "Wait, we were supposed to bring gifts." Just to just to raise awareness that we don't really know how many wise men there were. Um, To poke at things a little bit more, um, the story as we understand it is Mary and Joseph arriving uh, in Jerusalem on the back of a donkey at the very last minute. She's about to pop, and they're running from door to door looking for anywhere that they might be given a room, might be given a place, might be given a little spot for this woman to give birth. If, if we hold that image for a moment and juxtapose it with what we know about Middle Eastern hospitality. Now, we didn't talk about this a lot last week. We probably should have. But hospitality is one of the primary things that is embedded in all Middle Eastern culture through all of time, including today. Today, you can go into um, a Bedouin tent and they will serve you, they will feed you, they will give you a place to rest. And the idea is that they are called to serve you for up to three days without ever asking you a question, without even needing to know your name. So there's something a little funny about a couple, a young couple, not being offered hospitality in this culture. The other thing that we've got to remember is that the reason Joseph was going to Bethlehem was because he owned property there or his family owned property there. It was a census. Everybody had to return to pay taxes on their property. So somebody in Joseph's family has property in Bethlehem, maybe even Joseph himself. The third thing I want to bring attention to is this word in. Many of our translations say there was no room for them in the inn. And when we hear the word inn, our mind immediately goes to Holiday Inn, Hampton Inn, Motel 6. We think of a hotel. Some of, uh, there are two words for inn in the New Testament. The word inn in this particular context in Luke could be better translated a guest room. Now, again, that could, that could be a guest room in a hotel. It could be a guest room in a house. But there is another word for inn that specifically means a hotel, a place for travelers, a place where you can stop and go have a room for a certain period of temporary time. That is the word that's used in the parable of the Good Samaritan, when the Good Samaritan takes the wounded man to an inn. That's not the word that's used in the birth of Jesus accounts. The word that's used there is guest room. In that culture, it was common for a young man when he was getting married to build a guest room, a separate room, an extra room, a small room on his father's house to bring his new bride. They would live there for a certain period of time until it was time for them to start their own house, build their own place. When we think about the birth of Jesus and these narratives within their historical and cultural context, what makes much more sense is that Jesus was actually born at home, most likely in Joseph's dad's house. Now, I know what you're saying, but wait a minute. It said that he was placed in a manger because there was no room in the inn. If we remember from last week the way that houses were built, the bottom floor was a kitchen and a barn. Because Mary and Joseph were in this very small guest room, not ready to start this big family, and because the birthing process in the first century was the most dangerous moment in a woman's life, It was filled with midwives, with women, with helpers. There wasn't enough room in the guest room. And so they moved the birthing process down to the lower level of the house. And yes, they did use the stone feeding trough for animals. Yes, there were animals present. 
but Jesus was most likely, given what we know about historical and cultural context, birthed in to a loving family with friends and others present, like many of us would experience. Now, on one hand, you think, oh, well, that just ruined the Christmas story for me. And there goes the miracle. I would actually argue, doesn't it make it so much more poignant and special to think about Jesus' family welcoming him into his earthly life with open arms? All right, there's a lot more you can read about that. If you're really upset about it, I would point you to Kenneth Bailey's uh, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, and he'll destroy it even more for you. Another thing that I, I want to bring up is we often think about Joseph as the innocent bystander. Right, poor Joseph is just this guy minding his own business and an angel shows up and says, yeah, your fiance is right. Sorry, your life is wrecked. Um, when we think about the influence that Joseph would have had on Jesus' life, I think Joseph must have been a pretty special guy. Uh, Mary and Joseph both. Obviously, we know that they were very devout because they physically took the offering for Jesus uh, after his birth to Jerusalem. They went to the feast, it seemed, every year because that was the pattern that Jesus uh, was in as an adult. Mary and Joseph were Jesus' primary teachers, especially during his childhood. And so they were evidently, and we know, we know something about Joseph too in, in his, his, because of his devotion, um, but also because he was a righteous man, he wanted to put Mary away quietly. He was willing to kind of risk his own reputation to protect her. They were good people. They were devout people. Um, and, I, and I just I have to think that God was very intentional about the choosing of Jesus' earthly parents. All right, um, you fast forward uh, several years, 30 years, and you find John the Baptist on the scene, and John the Baptist is preaching a baptism of repentance. This is kind of stirring up the religious crowd a little bit because um, there was this ritual cleansing that Jewish people did on a regular basis um, to go into the temple, to go do religious activity, and then there was conversion cleansing that was done for proselytes, people that were not Jewish but wanted to convert to the Jewish faith. And basically John the Baptist is saying, hey, we all need a baptism of repentance. Not just a, not just a ritual cleansing, we need a baptism of repentance. And the idea was that people believed that if, if, we all bapt- if we all go through this repentance, the Messiah will come. And sure enough, one day, Jesus shows up on the banks of the Jordan River. I've got a picture. I showed it on week one. I'll show it again. This is the Jordan River. It's not where the baptism of Jesus happened, but it's the same river. And uh, Jesus says, hey, I want to be baptized. This is my paraphrase. John the Baptist says, no, 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 you should baptize me. Jesus says we must do what I- everything that is right. Um, and at that point, um, a dove comes and rests on Jesus' shoulder, and a voice is heard from heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. If I were Jesus' PR manager, this is the moment I would go raise somebody from the dead I would go do, you know, change the water into wine. I mean, I would do something big. And yet Jesus goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. There's something that Jesus is probably doing here um, to, to be an echo of the Moses narrative in the wilderness. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. There he's tempted. He's tempted in three different areas. Uh, The enemy says, take the stone, turn it to bread. Enemy tempted him in the place of his physical needs. One definition of sin is meeting legitimate needs in illegitimate ways. Jesus had a legitimate hunger need at that point, and yet to go... um, when, he, when he's in a place of fasting um, as an expression of devotion to the Lord to then go do a miracle just to, to meet a physical need would be an illegitimate way of meeting that need. He was tempted in the area of power. If you throw yourself off the temple, the angels will come rescue you and won't that be a great image to the world of who you are and what you're about. He was tempted in the place of pride. If you fall down and worship me, I will give you all the nations, the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And with each temptation, Jesus resisted it by quoting scripture. 
Um, I'm still, even though we have version and Bible apps and other instant access, on-demand access to Scripture, I believe there's something that is powerful and um, necessary about memorizing Scripture. There is something about hiding God's Word in our hearts that makes us stronger, that makes us have an ability to have a higher level of faith and faithfulness, and in those moments of compromise, we can lean on it much more quickly. Um, There were five major things that John records as Jesus first in his ministry. The first miracle was the turning of water into wine. Um, I, I, I love this miracle because Jesus is at a party, which means like he had like he was he had a social circle. He had friends. He was invited to this party. And then his mom comes along and says, Hey, they've run out of wine. Can you do something about it? Jesus kind of like dismisses his mom, says, My time hasn't come. And, and I love this story because it's like, what does Mary know at this point? And what conversations have they had? And, uh, and it's, it's, it's been argued that, well, Jesus actually wound up changing the water into wine because Mary, he had a Jewish mama. And you do what Jewish mamas tell you to do. Um, but for whatever reason, Jesus turns the water into wine, and it's to do a friend a favor. Like, they'd run out of wine. It was a very embarrassing moment at this party. And Jesus does this. He, it's, you know, and, and he says, hey, just I'm going to be in the background on this. Um, he did a miracle, his first miracle, to just love on one of his friends. Um, First temple cleansing, if that, whether it happened at the beginning, you know, or the end, John puts at the beginning, uh, the disciples are chosen. There's a conversation with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus on the idea of being born again and the necessity of being born again. And then there's the conversation with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, that set the stage for Jesus saying, my message transcends this culture and this people, and is for all nations. Um, some of the teachings of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount is the most famous, Matthew 5 to 7, is a collection. Now, I don't think that this was a one-time, one-and-done sermon. I don't think that he necessarily stood up in one place and, and gave all of Matthew 5 to 7 in one time. I think it's a collection of many of his teachings that he gave regularly over and over again. And they were collected in these chapters in the book of Matthew. We find the Beatitudes. We find him talking about being the fulfillment of the law, which is the disorientation series we've been in over the past few weeks. Uh, He teaches his disciples how to pray. And then we find something that we only find on the lips of Jesus. A lot of the things that Jesus taught, again, he's coming from a specific historical and cultural context. And so he's saying things that maybe other Jewish rabbis are talking about as well, but he's giving his unique spin on. But the thing that makes Jesus unique, the thing that makes him stand out was the moment he said, love your enemies. You do not find that statement on the mouth, on the lips of any other Jewish rabbi. The call to love your enemies was specifically unique to Jesus. And when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus looks at this uh, young scholar and, and says, well, what do you think it reads? How do you read it? How do you read the law? And he said, well, the greatest commandment is you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus also pulls out, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we often read those as love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And then the second greatest commandment, which Jesus says is the greatest, it's like it, but it's probably a little bit like on a rung a little bit lower is love your neighbor as yourself. Um, Again, we have filters when we read this stuff. And so what this often gets interpreted as is, hey, the greatest command is love God. And then don't forget, also, it's important that you love your neighbor like yourself. And we often interpret that like yourself, meaning you need to love other people to the same level that you love yourself, which then sometimes turns into sermons about how important it is to have healthy self-esteem. When Jesus says love your neighbor as yourself, what he's meaning there is, if you go in the original language, is love your neighbor who is like you. Love your neighbor who is also a human being. Love your neighbor who is also a flesh and blood person that has fears, has insecurities, has hopes, has dreams. 
They're a person made in the image of God. How can you love a God you've never seen if you can't love the image of God that is standing right in front of you? So love your neighbor as yourself isn't love other people to the same level that you love yourself, but rather love the person that is standing in front of you bearing the image of God. The other thing Jesus is doing here is he's interpreting one verse using another verse. So probably every Jewish rabbi would say the greatest command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then they would go to another verse of the Mosaic Law to interpret that through. So different rabbis would have different second interpretation verses that they would use that would become their standard. The one Jesus goes to is this very obscure little verse in Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. And so when Jesus says, love God, we tend to read love God and love your neighbor. What Jesus is more likely doing based on the language in the original text is love God by loving your neighbor. That your love for God is reflected in and measured by how you love the people that are right in front of you. And all of a sudden, the teachings of Jesus, the yoke of Jesus, though he says it is light, can become very difficult. The teachings of Jesus are disorienting because sometimes they're difficult to understand. They are always difficult to apply, difficult to obey. Jesus taught a number of parables. He did a ton of miracles. And his mission... Um, his mission was, uh, we often think his mission was the cross, and it most certainly was that. But when Jesus stood up for the first time and said, this is who I am, this is what I'm about, when he read from the Isaiah scroll in the synagogue, it was all about bringing freedom to captives, bringing um, sight to the blind, bringing healing to the sick. He was about, on the first week, we talked about those story arcs of, like, rec- uh, of exile to restoration and bondage to, um, to liberation. That was all part of Jesus' mission. And not only that, but it was to bring this message outside just the Jewish people. All right, in your notes, you have a, a various lists. You've got lists of the names of the disciples. Um, you've got a list of some of the major events, major teachings, major parables in Jesus' life. Um, you know, at, at one point, Jesus begins talking about his own death. It's actually kind of fascinating in the book of Mark. It's recorded three different times, and like right after, like in great succession. Um, hey, guys, listen, we're going to Jerusalem. Um, I'm going to be betrayed into the enemy's hands. They're going to kill me, but don't worry, I'm going to rise again on the third day. And then the disciples are like, so what John and I have been discussing is when you come into your kingdom, who's going to be greatest? Like me? Him? Like just totally missing the point. Uh, Jesus tries to give them plenty of heads up, plenty of instruction on what's coming, and the disciples continually do not get it. He walks with them for three years. He's te- he teaches them, performs miracles. He, um, he, uh, he talks about how he's the fulfillment of the law. And then he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover, um, we read about the triumphal entry, Mark 11, and, uh, and from here the story, it, it kind of becomes a little bit complicated, complex. We're not entirely sure what happens when, but this is kind of my best attempt to put it together. So on Sunday he comes in the triumphal entry to the people shouting, uh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On Monday he goes into the temple, wipes it out, um, chases the money changers out. On Tuesday... Um, he was anointed by this woman. Um, he was sitting with, uh, with people uh, eating dinner and, and is interrupted by this woman who wants to anoint him and wash his feet. On Wednesday, there was probably uh, the, the murmurs, the conversations, the plots to have him killed. Thursday uh, was the Last Supper and his prayer in Gethsemane. In, in Gethsemane, um, Judas has already left the feast. Um, Judas was the treasurer of the group. And Judas most likely was not wanting to have Jesus killed, but rather wanting to give Jesus a platform to come to 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 um to basically declare that he was the Messiah. Um, Judas felt like Jesus needed a tipping point to just say, "Hey guys, it's over, done. I'm Messiah. I'm now on the throne." 
Um, and and we, we, we know this because of Judas' reaction after um, he saw what was happening to Jesus. So the Last Supper, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Um, this, is, uh, this is just kind of off um, rabbit trail for a moment, but it says that in, in, the, in, the, the, in the Last Supper narrative, it says that Jesus realized that all authority in heaven and earth, on earth had been given to him. So he got up from the table, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. There's something really powerful about that. There was this moment where Jesus realized, I am the most powerful person in the room. And the way he leveraged that power was to wash the feet of his disciples, including the one that would betray him. I just think that's a great question for us today. Like, in those moments... It might be in a conference room, it might be in a meeting, it might be in our family. Uh, it, you know, Every now and then there's this moment where it occurs to us, all eyes are on us. I'm the decision maker or I'm the person in charge. I'm the one that has to make the decision. I'm the most powerful person in the room. Do we leverage that power for our own comfort or do we leverage that power to serve the people in the room? Um, Jesus is betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is taken to Annas, who had been the high priest from 6 to 15 AD, and then taken to Annas' son-in-law Caiaphas, who was the current high priest. Um, they uh, had a, him brought before a mock trial uh, with the Jewish Sanhedrin, or part of the Sanhedrin. And um, that next day they voted to condemn him. Uh, meanwhile, Peter has denied him three times, and Judas has taken his own life. Now, the Jews had condemned Jesus to death on the basis of blasphemy, but they did not have the authority to carry out his execution. So they had to take him to the Roman authorities and had to come up with another reason for a death penalty. And so they accused Jesus of sedition, saying that he claimed to be the king of the Jews and was therefore a political threat. Pilate, we don't have time to go into this, but Pilate was a suck-up to Roman authority. Pilate wanted to be seen as courageous. He wanted to be seen as a man who kept things in order. He wanted to be seen as a guy who um, was greatly admired and respected. He did not want a problem in this area where he had been given governmental control. Pilate is, uh, sees Jesus and then says, hey, he's not my problem, sends him to Herod. Herod um, spends a little bit of time with him, sends him back to Pilate. Pilate offers the release of a prisoner. The Jewish people shout for Barabbas. And again, when they talk about the crowds, I think it's important to like rethink what that crowds meant. This was likely a crowd of people that were drummed up by the Jewish Sanhedrin, not the common people of Jerusalem. They ask for Barabbas, Jesus is then whipped, and then finally Pilate gives the order for execution. At this moment, the sun is coming up, Jerusalem is coming awake, and people realize that something terrible has happened, and Jesus is being led up to the rock of Golgotha. Now, a lot of times we think, uh, again, our pictures of the crucifixion are of this high hill, and the cross is lifted high up on this hill, um, the reality is the Romans uh, crucified people at eye level. It was also a, um, it was a holiday week, and so lots of pilgrims were coming into Jerusalem. There would likely have been a lot of crucifixions taking place that week because the Roman government wanted to send a clear message to zealots to Jewish nationalists, to any with high hopes of Jewish redemption. These people have crossed Roman authority, and this too will happen to you. So when it says that Jesus was crucified on the skull, or the, the, the rock of the skull, it's probably because he was crucified in a place where so many other crucifixions had happened that it became known as the place of the skull. Jesus dies on the cross between two thieves, and then we have a period of darkness, um, and then on Sunday, so they, they, the Sabbath is observed. And then on Sunday, um, the stone rolls away. A group of women come to the tomb. Now, this is where the four Gospels get really muddled. As you can imagine, I mean, this was like 
it's, it's hard enough to remember details, but when you're talking about something this momentous and this big, in so many different rumors and conversations and experiences and encounters happening, it's hard to keep track from gospel to gospel to gospel exactly what was the order of events. The best way I seem to be able to put it together is that women came to the tomb, and remember they were coming to bury a dead man. They did not expect to find what we knew happened. They found the stone had been rolled away. Jesus was not there, and an angel told them that Jesus had been raised from the dead. seems as though Mary then runs back ahead of the other women, finds Peter and John, and all three of them come back to the tomb together. Peter and John see that it's empty, and they go away perplexed. Mary stays around and then encounters Jesus in bodily form in the garden near the tomb. Jesus then appears to two people on the road to Emmaus, um, and it's fascinating. He tells them all about about the Old Testament prophecies that are pointing to the Messiah. They don't realize who he is until he sits at a table and breaks bread with them and blesses it. Then Jesus appears to the disciples. Thomas isn't with them. Thomas, poor doubting Thomas. Um, but Thomas said the same thing I would have said. I'm not going to believe it until I can put my fingers into his wrists, uh, into his feet, into his side. Then Jesus shows up again to all the disciples, including Thomas. And then Peter does what he does best. He goes fishing. And Jesus shows up once again on the banks of the Lake of Galilee. And Peter hasn't caught anything. And he does a repeat of his first encounter with Peter. Throw the nets on the other side. And they pull up um, a net full of fish. Peter comes ashore. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know that I do. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? He asked Peter three times, perhaps to hit a reset on Peter's heart for denying him three times. The book of John ends with, and I suppose that if all the other things Jesus did were written down, the whole world would not contain the books. So Jesus walks amongst the people, makes appearances and uh, for 40 days, and then he ascends into heaven before he does. He tells the disciples to do two things. One, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Then he also says, um, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded, and I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And then he goes to heaven. And the disciples are all like left standing there. And it's interesting because when you read the account in Matthew, it says that the 11 were there and some worshipped, but others doubted. They're still not sure what's going on. But they go and they pray for 10 days. They go to Jerusalem, they wait, and that's where we flip over to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the history of the early church. It kind of comes in two parts. There's Acts 1 to 12, which basically tells the story of Peter, John, Stephen, Philip, uh, James, and then the rest of the book, Acts 13 on, focuses primarily on the ministry of Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and some of their other uh, missionary companions. So, um, so three thousand. So, so people saw Jesus. They walked. He walked among them. He ascended, giving them the command: go wait for the Holy Spirit and go make disciples. And uh, ten days later, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the Holy Spirit came on all the believers who were together, specifically mentions that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was among them. I just think that's kind of cool. Like 33 years earlier, the Holy Spirit had come on Mary to incarnate Christ within her. And now the Holy Spirit has come on Mary again to commission her to take that teaching to the rest of the world. Um, so the Holy Spirit comes on uh, uh, the people in Jerusalem. 3,000 people were saved and baptized in one day. We might wonder where in the world were they baptized? They're in Jerusalem. Well, all around Jerusalem are these ritual cleansing baths. As I mentioned earlier, Jewish people had to go through ritual cleansing in order to go in to the temple to be to be pure um, and to do sacrifices in the temple. So there are all these little pools around Jerusalem. We have a picture um, of one that uh, that's actually Pastor Mark filming in one of these, and um, and then also Pastor Dave. It doesn't look anything like him, but um, that's filming there. But these are called mikvah. 
They are all over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So now it makes sense, historically, how 3,000 people could have easily been baptized in one day. Peter and John uh, get up the next day. They go to the temple. They encounter a crippled man who asks for some money. They say, silver and gold I have not, but what I do have I give you. Rise in the name of Jesus and walk. He's healed. This causes an uproar. They're thrown into prison. Then they're released, told to stop preaching. People don't know what to do with these guys. In Acts 6, they're finding there's so much ministry that they need a new system, and the first deacons are appointed to help care for the needs of the followers of this newly formed church. Acts 7, we find a man by the name of Stephen, who is one of the first deacons, who is martyred. Some of the religious leaders in Jerusalem wanted to put an end to the Jesus cult, and Stephen was martyred. A man was standing there, having given the authority for the killing and holding the coats of those who were stoning. His name was Saul. Uh, Next, Philip goes to Samaria, And a revival breaks out there. And in order to help teach and disciple, Paul and John are then sent. The Holy Spirit comes on them in the same way that he had come on those at the day of Pentecost. So now we see the gospel going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. Then Philip gets into a chariot with an Ethiopian eunuch who is reading the Isaiah scroll, is needing help understanding it. Philip then um, gets in the chariot with him, explains the Isaiah scroll, and talks about how it points to Jesus. The Ethiopian gets out and is baptized. Now the gospel has gone from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Acts 9 becomes a hinge point for the book of Acts and for church history. When Saul, the man who had given authority for the killing of uh, Christians, who was carrying warrants for arrest for Christians, had an encounter, had a vision with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was blinded, he was knocked off his horse, and he heard, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was given instruction to go on into Damascus, although uh, with his tail between his legs, because he was like the guy that was supposed to be there to arrest Christians. And here he is blind and desperate and at their mercy. A man named Ananias takes him in, heals him, feeds him, takes care of him, presents him to the church. And God said that Saul would be his instrument of salvation to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people. Now, one comment, because from here on out, I'll refer to him as Paul. Um, The name Saul and the name Paul are the same name. Paul is just the Greek rendering, the Greek pronunciation, the Greek spelling of the Hebrew name Saul. Many of us have probably heard sermons about how Saul became Paul. His name did not get changed. It's just the same name. And the reason he's referred to as Saul in this part of the text is because it's still very much rooted in a Jewish context. When he begins to go on his missionary journeys and take the gospel to the Gentiles, he begins being known by his Greek name, Paul. Um, Peter has a vision. Uh, He's praying one day on the rooftop. He has a vision of a sheet with all these animals that come on it, and he's told to rise and eat. Kill and eat. He's like, there are all these unclean animals. I'm not going to get up and kill and eat an unclean animal. Well, at the same time he is having that vision, there's a man named Cornelius who is a God-fearer. He's a Gentile. He's in the Roman army. But he has great respect for the God of the Jewish people. He prays. He gives alms. He helps the poor. He's a righteous man. He he has been told to go find uh, Peter. So the family of Cornelius comes, shows up on Peter's door and says, hey, we, we were told to come find you because we want to hear this message that you have. Cor- uh, Peter kind of connects the dots, goes to Cornelius's house, and for the first time, as far as we can tell, Cornelius steps into the home of a Gentile. And he actually makes a big deal about it. He's like, you all know I'm not supposed to be here. It's against our law, and it's against our custom. It's like he's covering his bases. But then he shares the gospel. He shares the message of Jesus. We find out that Cornelius and his whole family are baptized. The Holy Spirit comes on them in the same way it had come on the people on the day of Pentecost, on the day, same way it had come on the Samaritans and their revival. And once again, we see the gospel going to non-Jewish people. Going, It's the beginnings of going to the ends of the earth. Um, 
Barnabas goes off to work with the Gentiles to start sharing the gospel with them, and he takes along a guy by the name of Paul. Peter is uh, thrown into prison. James and Peter are thrown into prison. James, the disciple, uh, will be killed. He will not make it out of prison. Peter will escape. And um, let's take a moment there to just take a break. So it's about uh, seven, it's 7.59. Let's just call it 8. Let's take a 10-minute break, come back together at 8.10, and we'll jump in to the, uh, Paul's first missionary journey. All right, we've gotten through four books and some change. We've got like 23 more, so I'm going to go quickly. So um, at this point, from this moment on, the rest of the book of Acts focuses primarily on the three missionary journeys of Paul. So the first one begins in Acts 13, goes to Acts 15, around 46 to 48 AD. It's around Asia Minor, from Antioch to Cyprus to Pisidian Antioch. Uh, there's a map in, your, uh, in week one of that missionary journey. He's sharing the gospel. Um, they're meeting with like-minded people. Um, and uh, at the end of that 12-month trip, um, they go back to Antioch, and then they go to the Council of Jerusalem. We'll come back to that in just a moment. During this time, the book of James was most likely written. Now, there are four different men in the New Testament that go by the name of James. There's James, the brother of Jesus, James, the disciple and brother of John, James, son of Alphaeus, and James, the father of Judas. Of all four of those James, based on when it was written, based on the content, uh, based on church history, um, or tradition, James, the brother of Jesus, is by far the closest uh, or the, the most likely candidate for this book. Particularly when you read James, James, more than any other epistle in the New Testament, sounds a lot like Jesus. When Jesus talks about practical ways of loving people, practical ways about living out your faith, James sounds so much like Jesus. Like maybe they had the same person discipling them as they were children. Um, James is very practical in his approach to faith. Um, it was probably written sometime around 48 AD. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And how cool is it that we have a book in our Bible written by the brother of Jesus? That, again, like coming to the Bible, we don't have to believe that the Bible is true or accurate or trustworthy of any of those things to just think it's interesting. And isn't it interesting that we can read a book written by the brother of Jesus? Now, if we just think for a moment, what would it take, what would you have to do to get your brother to believe that you're the Messiah? I just want us to consider that for a moment. And yet James came to a place where he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He worshiped Jesus, gave his life to build his brother's church and kingdom. Acts 15 is the Council of Jerusalem. This is a pivotal moment. We, most of us, are here today because of the Jerusalem Council. Unless you are Jewish, we would not be here if the Jerusalem Council had not gone the way it did. So if we set everything in the original context, the earliest church was Jewish. It wasn't called a church. It was just gatherings of people that still went to the temple, still went to the synagogue, but met in homes as followers of Jesus. The earliest followers of Jesus were Jewish. Well, now Peter's going to Cornelius' house, and Paul and Barnabas are going around Asia Minor, and there are all these people that are claiming to be followers of Jesus, but they're not Jewish. Being a follower of Jesus was a sect of Judaism. It was, a, it was a subset, a denomination of sorts of Judaism. And so there were people saying, you can't be a follower of Jesus unless you're Jewish. He was a Jewish rabbi. So if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to follow the law, and you've got to go through a ritual cleansing. You've got to convert to Judaism in order to follow Jesus. There was another group of people, and Paul would be among them, who would say, hey, we've never been able to really keep the law ourselves. 
And it wasn't written for them, so why are we putting that on them? Jesus' message transcends our culture, transcends our boundaries. Let's not make it hard on them. Let's not make it hard on the Gentiles who want to follow Jesus. And so the great question facing the early church was, did you have to become culturally Jewish in order to follow Jesus? And the result of the Jerusalem council that they said it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit was to not require that Gentiles become Jewish in order to worship Jesus. They said, we asked that they would respect three laws. One, that they would refrain from idolatry, that they would refrain from sexual immorality, and refrain from murder. Now that seems like a pretty low bar to us. And to the Jewish people, it was a little bit insane. When you're having to follow Sabbath, when you're having to follow purity laws, when you're having to do all these things, and to find that now you've got to share your table with people that, oh, they just don't worship idols and they don't have sex with people that aren't their spouse and they, you know, they don't murder and then they're good. God's good with them. That was hard for the Jewish people. But then on the other hand, when you think about the Roman Empire and the culture of the Roman Empire, this was hitting at the very fabric of their culture. Idolatry worship was central to ever, like, you you couldn't go to work without worshiping the idol. You you couldn't go to the gymnasium without there being idolatry practiced. Um, Sexual immorality was rampant in that culture. When you think about bloodshed, I mean, the games of the Colosseum and the games of the Circus Maximus were all centered around bloodshed. It was going to be very difficult to be in the army, to be an entrepreneur, to be a businessman, to have any kind of trade in the Roman Empire and be a follower of Jesus. So it was very, very difficult on both sides. But the question was, can these two groups of people from such different backgrounds, different cultures, come together around a shared table to worship Jesus? And the decision of the Jerusalem Council, in my opinion, has made Christianity available to the ends of the earth and is part of the reason that we're here today. Um, The book of Galatians, I want to talk about that right now. There are two different possible moments where this was written. It could have been written during Paul's third missionary journey, or it could have been written in this moment in time. My preference is to believe that it was written in this period of time because of the nature of the topics that are addressed. Galatians is a very theological book. It was written by Paul, and it addresses this idea of Judaizers, people who are trying to make Gentiles become more Jewish. People that are saying you have to be circumcised in order to be a follower of Jesus. These themes are addressed in the book of Galatians. In fact, Paul lets his real feelings out in Galatians 5.12 when he says, As for those agitators, I wish they would go all the way and emasculate themselves. Paul has very strong opinions about this. But because of the context of the Jerusalem Council, it makes sense that Galatians was written at this time. We also see things in Galatians like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And we see in Galatians 2, 20, his statement of faith, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's second missionary journey begins in Acts 15. You've also got a map that tracks along with this. And in this uh, journey, Paul and Barnabas had gone together. Barnabas had been the guy that had discipled Paul, had like stood up for his reputation. They went on the first missionary journey together, and then they got in an argument about this guy named John Mark. And Paul says, look, if he's going to desert us in the middle of a trip, I'm not going with him. Barnabas says, we need to give the kid another chance. They can't agree on this, so Barnabas goes one way with John Mark. Paul takes on a new Uh, a new partner by the name of Silas, and they go on uh, this journey uh, through Asia Minor. And so they're going to visit all these different places that they've been to before, and the Holy Spirit keeps saying, don't stop here, not there, this isn't where I've called you. On the first night, we talk about the fact that they didn't uh, know where they were supposed to go until they got to Troas, 450 miles away. And then Paul gets a vision of the Macedonian man saying, come over here. Macedonia and and Achaia are talked about as the northern and southern parts of modern-day Greece. So Paul goes to to, um, 
across uh, the the water there to to uh, what is modern day Greece, the area of Macedonia, and the gospel then goes to the continent of Europe. Uh, the first major city he goes to is Philippi. Uh, I've got a picture of the gates of Philippi. They're still standing today. This is where Paul would have entered the city. Again, just a reminder, this is a real story, real time, real place, real people, really happened. At Philippi, he goes and, and they find a, a woman by the name of Lydia, who is a God-fearer, like Cornelius. She's a Gentile, but she has respect for the Jewish faith, and she worships the Jewish God. They present to her the gospel of Jesus. She and her entire family are baptized and saved. Then Paul and um, Silas cast a demon out of a girl. They're thrown into prison. And uh, that night, the jailer and his entire family are saved and are baptized. And thus, the gospel goes to the continent of Europe. He then goes to Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki. Uh, on his road there, he would have passed by this statue, which is the Lion of Amphipolis. This was erected by the uh, generals of Alexander the Great. Um, it has been standing since the time of Paul. He would have passed that line as he went on the Via Ignatia to Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, there's an a angry group of, of Jewish people that attack him. He escapes in the middle of the night. He goes to Berea, where he says that he is more impressed with them than any of the other people that he has addressed because they seek out from the scriptures for themselves what to believe and why to believe it. goes from there to Athens, where he enters the Areopagus. The Areopagus is the place where philosophers... And, um, and speakers and orators would debate and bring ideas. And in the midst of the, the pantheon of all of the Roman gods and in, in, in standing um, in, in eyeshot of the Acropolis and the Parthenon, um, Paul would say, you are a very religious people. You even have an altar to a God that you don't know. Let me tell you who this God is. He presents Jesus to them, and some of the leading philosophers accept his message. From there, Paul goes to Corinth, where he spends a year and a half. Uh, he meets up with uh, a couple named Aquila and Priscilla, and together, um, all together they are tent makers, and they continue to share uh, the gospel um, in that place. It's interesting how Paul, there's a place where Paul talks about, I become all things to all people so that by all means I might win some. And we see this tangibly in Paul's life. In Athens, it was perfectly acceptable for you to just be a philosopher or an orator or a debater. You didn't have to have like a job with your hands. And so in Athens, that's who he is. He's a philosopher, an orator, he's a, a theologian. But in Corinth, you were not considered to be a contributing member of society unless you had a job unless you are creating things for the public good. So in Corinth, he becomes a tent maker, was most likely a tent maker for the Corinthian games. We're very familiar with the Olympic games. In Paul's time, there were four different kinds of games, and the Corinthian games were one of them. The starting blocks for the race in the Corinthian games is still seen in Corinth today. I've also brought a picture of um, the Bema. This would be the place in Corinth where... Um, where judicial verdicts were reached, where orators could speak, where different um, uh, civil matters could be handled. In the background, the, the giant mountain there would be um, what's called the Acrocorinth, and that's where the temple of Aphrodite was. Um, at the end of that missionary journey, Paul comes back around, he goes back to Jerusalem, and in order to dispel rumors that he is dismissive of the Jewish law, he undergoes some Jewish um, purification rituals and pays for others to do so as well, just as a means of saying, I'm still a Jewish guy, just because I'm ministering to Gentiles does not mean I think that we can just um, do away with all of the Jewish law. Um, that journey in total lasted a, uh, roughly over two years. Um, during that time, First and Second Thessalonians would have been written. So he's writing back, to that first city, one of the first cities that he visited. Um, in Thessalonica, it was a, a Roman province. Um, it was a naval base. It was a commercial center. And um, it was a very thriving city. The followers of Jesus there were very concerned. Their big concern was, 
we've been told that we're going to be able to enter in the kingdom of God and that we're going to be, you know, Jesus is coming back, and yet some of our family members have died. So does that mean that they're not going to be able to participate in the blessing of Jesus' return? Paul writes them and tells them, no, everyone, whether they are living, whether they have died, will be able to participate in Jesus' kingdom in his return. He warns them against um, idleness and careless action. There are people in Thessalonica that just said, well, Jesus come back any day, so I'm quitting my job. I don't have to do anything anymore. I'm just going to wait around for his return. And Paul says, no, you need to be active contributing members of your city, of your culture, of your community. The return of Jesus, because that's such a prominent theme on the hearts of these people, is mentioned five times in the book, in the, in the letter of 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians contains a lot of the same themes as 1 Thessalonians. Again, it's looking forward to Christ's coming and warning them against careless action, against idle, uh, just, you know, uh, being idle in their time and not being productive and not being contributing people uh, in society. His third missionary journey is sometime around 54 AD to 58 AD, um, and he makes Ephesus his home base for this missionary journey. And from there, he's traveling all over Asia Minor, um, visiting various churches um, that he's planted, different communities of faith. And, uh, and we find the letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians. I, I should back up and say there were kind of four kinds of letters that Paul wrote. There were theological letters like Galatians, Romans that kind of carried more theological themes. There were problem-solving letters, which are what the bulk of them were. So 1st, 2nd Thessalonians were problem-solving. 1st, 2nd Corinthians were problem-solving, written to churches to help them know how to do church. Personal letters like to Timothy and to Titus. Um, and then prison letters, letters that he would write later from Rome in prison. So 1st, 2nd Corinthians are problem-solving, and there were a lot of problems in Corinth. Paul actually wrote four letters to the church in Corinth. We have two of them today in our Bible. They're called 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They're actually more like 2nd Corinthians and 4th Corinthians. We know this because of references made to previous letters and answers that he seems to be giving to previous questions. The church in Corinth is asking Paul practical advice on how to do their faith and how to do church, and he's responding to that. Um, Again, we saw a moment ago the Acro Corinth where the temple of Aphrodite was. She was the goddess of love. Um, down uh, in the area where the Bema was, if you look across the, um, the way, you would see the temple of Apollo, who was the god of wisdom. So in Corinth, wisdom and love are the primary gods. They're highly worshipped. They're highly esteemed. So when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he's talking about God being the true source of wisdom, in 1 Corinthians 13, everybody's favorite wedding passage, God being the God of love, he is speaking very specifically into their culture and in their language. Corinth also has a ton of problems. They are messed up. They're dealing with big egos. They're dealing with idolatry, with divorce and separation, sexual promiscuity, uh, big fights over doctrine. There are people getting drunk off communion. Now, you know there is a problem in your church when people are getting drunk off communion. It was also before they had the little shot glass things that we use for our communion today. Um, so Paul is writing encouragement. He is giving them practical advice. The same thing is happening in 2 Corinthians. Again, he's just answering their questions. And he's giving, um, he, he's giving some perspective on a little bit of overcorrection. In 1 Corinthians, he felt like he had been too harsh in a couple areas. And so he comes back and, and, and gives a little bit different perspective and a different angle and loosens up a little bit on some of the overcorrection that he felt he had given in the first letter. Uh, he also writes Romans. Roman, he had never been to the church in Rome. He greatly desired to go to the church in Rome and wanted to write them some encouragement. We often view Romans as a very theological book. In fact, any kind of commentary, any study you do on Romans is going to focus on the theology in this book. It was pivotal in the Reformation. It was pivotal before the Reformation. Uh, um, uh, uh, Augustine's doctrine of original sin, which has influenced Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant theology, 
was derived from his reading in the book of Romans. Martin Luther's doctrine of justification by faith came from the book of Romans. John Calvin's doctrines of predestination on the uh, doctrines of grace on the sovereignty of God come from the book of Romans. I would also encourage you when you read Romans, don't just read it theologically, but also try to read it sociologically. If we remember the great challenge for the early church was the Jewish community and the Gentile community coming together to do life together, to eat together, to be at the same table, to be at the same room, to love one another. And I believe that one of the main reasons, although some of the great value to us today is the theology in Romans, I believe that the primary purpose that Paul had in writing it was to give some encouragement on how Christ, uh, I'm sorry, on how Jewish people and Gentile people can find that they come together in unity as they follow Jesus. I also love Romans 16. It has a list of names, random names, Erastus, Rufus, Gaius, Aquila, Priscilla, Olympus, Justice, And uh, you get to the end of Romans, all of this this great doctrinal stuff, theological stuff. It's like his big statement of faith has been given, and then he lets the credits roll. These are people that have shaped him, formed him, discipled him, people that he's discipled, people that have gone to jail with him, people that have brought him food in jail, people that have bankrolled his ministry. It's as though Paul gets to the end of his magnum opus and says, I can't tell my story of faith. I can't talk about what Jesus has done in my life. I can't tell you what I believe about Jesus and who he is without mentioning these names. Um, Paul recognizes the value of community. Um, After his third missionary journey, um, kind of hanging out in Ephesus and going around visiting different churches, uh, Paul's back in Jerusalem. He is once again attacked by, um, by some angry Jewish people, and he's actually saved Uh, by the Roman soldiers. Um, He's put on trial in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin, and he stirs up a debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And and after he stirs up that little debate, he just kind of backs up and eats his popcorn and watches the the flames go. Um, Anyway, he was eventually taken to Caesarea and uh, wound up just kind of being imprisoned there for two years. Caesarea was a um, maritime palace of uh, or coastal palace of King Herod, and Paul sits in prison in Caesarea just waiting. During this time, we don't hear a peep out of Paul. Some scholars believe he was depressed, that he wondered, what's my purpose in life? Have I come to the end? God, have you left me? Nothing comes out of Paul for two years. No letters, no writings, nothing. But it was probably during this time of waiting in two years that Luke wrote his gospel and wrote the majority of the book of Acts. So even though Paul felt like life was futile and life had come to an end and there was nothing he was doing and he was, maybe he was depressed, Luke was doing his homework, was conducting his interviews, was doing his research so that we today have his gospel and we have the account of the early church that we read in the book of Acts. Uh, While he's at Caesarea, he does uh, get to talk to Felix, who is the Judean governor. Um, He appears before Portius Festus, who also brings King Agrippa II before him, who actually King Agrippa II said he was almost persuaded by Paul's Paul's teachings about Jesus. Um, But eventually, uh, they suggest that he go back to the Jewish Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, Paul appeals to his Roman citizenship and therefore is allowed to go to Rome to make his case before the emperor. In Acts 27, he's on his way to Rome uh, when he's shipwrecked on the island of Malta. On the island of Malta, he's bitten by a snake. He flings it off into the uh, fire. The people think he is a god. He says, I am not a god, but I know who is. And revival comes to the island of Malta. He's been shipwrecked, he's been detoured and delayed, and yet God uses that to bring his story to a group of people that may have not heard for many years after. 
He gets in Rome, and in Rome, he is not placed before the emperor, but put under house arrest for two years. During this house arrest, he is very productive, and that's where we get the prison letters of Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians. Colossians focuses on the sovereignty of Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus, that whatever you think is important, Jesus is better. Uh, it was written to combat some heresy, some bad teaching that was coming in to the church. And G- in, 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 in Colossians, he's saying, look, Jesus is fully God, he's fully man, he's fully superior, and is meant to be worshipped. He also wrote the book of Philemon, which would have also been sent to a member of the church in Colossae. Um, at some point in Paul's missionary journey, there was a man named Onesimus that joined his traveling party. Onesimus had been a slave of the man named Philemon. We don't know why or how. We don't know how he came into Philemon's possession. We don't know how he came into relationship with Paul and on his missionary journeys. But as Paul is sending this letter back to the church, Uh, In Colossae, he also sends a letter to one of its members, Philemon, to say, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. This is a scary thing for Onesimus, but Paul has also basically said, it's really funny, you should read Philemon with this lens on, like, Paul is kind of saying, I know you will do the right thing. It's a little bit passive aggressive. He's telling him, I know he's your slave, but you receive him back as a brother in Christ. Church tradition would go on to say that um, Onesimus became one of the bishops at the church in Ephesus. Paul also wrote to the church in Ephesus. He wrote the book of Ephesians. Um, He had spent most of his time during his third missionary journey there. He knew this church. He loved this church. Um, Really didn't have a a ton of concerns with what was going on in the church, but was constantly encouraging them to remain in unity with one another. Um, Ephesians 6 is where we see the passage about the armor of God. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of work, so that no man can boast. Philippians was written to Philippi, that one of the first places in Europe that he visited. Uh, again, he knew the church in Philippi, loved the church in Philippi. This is one of the most joyful letters that we see. It's one of those joyful books in the entire Bible, and yet Paul is writing it from prison. He's encouraging them to have the same mindset of Christ, to walk in humility. Um, He talks about the idea that we've got to work out our salvation. Philippians 1.21, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Um, Philippians 4.13, I'm going to hit on this one just because it's a pet peeve a little bit. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We often find this verse um, emblazoned across jerseys or ball caps. Um, I actually owned one at one time in my life. It was some sort of like, you know, I, I can hit a home run because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, we sometimes use that as Christians as our I can win card. I can get the promotion. I can get the top job. I can get the big opportunity because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If we read this in context, again, Paul is writing from prison. He's not standing at home plate waiting to write to, to, to hit a home run. Paul is writing from prison and he's saying, I've been in poverty. I've been in wealth. I've been in sickness. I've been in health. I've had all of my needs taken care of. I've been in want. I've been hungry. I've been filled. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He's telling this church, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. God will give you the strength to navigate your circumstances. Philippi was a Roman colony. It was formed uh, out of a, um, a military victory, and so the people in Philippi were very proud of their Roman citizenship. And Paul constantly pointed them to the idea that they had a citizenship that was greater than their citizenship on earth, and it was a citizenship in heaven. Uh, What Paul does from here is a little unclear. We're not sure. So he's under house arrest for two years in Rome, but the book of Acts comes to an end. So we have to rely on church tradition, on history, to help us understand what happens next. It is possible that after those two years of house arrest that he was brought before the emperor to make his case and was eventually executed. 
That would have been around 64 AD, and the emperor would have been Nero. Other scholars point to this idea that perhaps Paul went on a fourth missionary journey. In fact, may have gone to Spain. Um, and in that scenario, would have then been later arrested and beheaded in 67 AD. We don't know for sure. But I'm going to stop for a moment there and jump over to Peter and talk about some of the letters that Peter wrote before I get back to Paul and the rest of his letters. First Peter was written primarily to Jewish followers of Jesus around 64 or 65 AD. It was written to people who were facing persecution, and Peter is saying that's part of the deal. It's part of the package. Make sure that you live lives of holiness and that you face persecution with holy courage and humble confidence. Second Peter carries some of these same themes. It was written right before his death, probably in 67 or 68 AD. And he's telling them that they need to be aware of false teachers and heresy that's creeping into the church. But again, to live productive lives. It's interesting in Second Peter, he references a moment that he had with Jesus. We didn't talk about it earlier tonight, but there's a moment, the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus and uh, Jesus takes John and James and Peter up, and they have this holy moment with Jesus. And Peter's like, oh, let's just build some little shelters and we can all stay here. And, uh, and he kind of gets shut down. And um, Peter brings that moment up again. It was so transformational, so life-changing for him that it gets mentioned in this last letter that he writes. All right, so then Paul's in prison waiting execution, whether it's still that two-year house arrest or it's yet another imprisonment down the road. And he writes three very personal letters, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. Timothy is a young man that had been on missionary journeys with him. His father was Greek. His mother was Jewish. And um, he is pastoring in Ephesus. And Paul is giving him instructions on how to lead, how to lead as a young leader, how to set qualifications for leadership in the church, how to do church. And there's an emphasis on sound doctrine and making sure that the right people are in those roles. It's also interesting when you look at the leadership qualification lists in 1 Timothy, they're not related to what you think would be leadership like gifts, like vision casting, strategy. Um, it's it's character-based. Like one of the qualifications is hospitality. Are you a person that's known for being hospitable in your community? Titus is another pastoral letter or personal letter. Um, Titus uh, joined up with Paul on his third missionary journey. And then Paul left Titus in Crete to pass to the church there. Crete was not as good of a job assignment as Ephesus was. Crete, um, this is how Cretans were described in the book of Titus. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. So similar to 1 Timothy, Paul writes Titus to give him instructions on leadership, how to lead as a young man in this church, and the qualifications for leaders that he would put in place uh, in that church. He, again, emphasizes sound doctrine, calls leaders to a higher standard. Then we get to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy would be the last letter that Paul would write. It would kind of be his last words. It's written to his protege, Timothy. And uh, he tells Timothy, the things that you have heard me teach amongst reliable witnesses Teach them to faithful men um, who will be able to teach others also. He's saying to Timothy, take the message you've received from me and pass it on to the next generation, who will pass it on to the next, who will pass it on to the next. It's Paul's way of reiterating the great commission that Jesus had given to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, commanding them to obey. It's also interesting at the end of 2 Timothy, he asks for John Mark to come visit him and says that John Mark would be helpful to him. So some reconciliation happened at some point between Paul and John Mark. All right, Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Um, it's one of the few books in or letters in the New Testament that doesn't have an author stamp on it. Some people think that Barnabas wrote it because Barnabas was a Levite, would have understood the Levitical law and the Levitical concepts that are talked about in the book. Um, some people believe that Luke wrote it because of the polished Greek writing style in it. Uh, the problem there is that Luke didn't come from that background, so wouldn't have been as, um, as well-versed in the Old Testament principles. Uh, a lot of people believe that Paul wrote it. What's weird about that is Paul always starts his letters with, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus. 
Um, so the fact that he wouldn't have like identified himself here is interesting. Uh, other other potential authors include Apollos. Um, some have even wondered if Priscilla wrote it. Um, but as Origen said, the author of Hebrews only God knows. Um, the book was written to Jewish people who had become followers of Jesus, but are now facing tremendous persecution. And the book of Hebrews is to remind them that God has sent Jesus, and Jesus is superior to all of the old ways, that he's fulfilling all of the old ways, that he's come not to abolish but to fulfill, and that following Jesus is worth it. Um, in that period of history, Jewish people were granted religious freedom, but followers of Jesus were beginning to be persecuted. There's also this really unique tie between Hebrews and Leviticus. We talked last week that Leviticus talks about the implementation of the sacrificial system. It talks about the role of the great high priest, and it talks about the um, of Jesus, um, and the heresy and the wrong belief, the wrong teaching that's coming in as a result. Jude quotes two apocryphal sources, the Assumption of Moses and the Book of Enoch, which makes it unique. All right. Now we come to the book of Revelation. So in the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, which are Gospels, Acts, which is history, the Epistles, which we've now kind of put into their chronological order in the book of Acts, and then we come to Revelation, which is apocalyptic writing. Apocalyptic writing was very popular in this time of history in the Jewish culture. Um, it's, a pop, it's apocalyptic, not necess which is a little bit different from the Old Testament prophets. There is some uh, future orientation to it. But it is also loaded with symbols, with allegory, with um, a language that was uh, very colorful and very graphic. The book of Revelation, and some of this is just a little bit of backstory, but, or uh, background. The book of Revelation is the one that most of us find the hardest to deal with. It's the hardest to know what it means. It's the hardest to interpret. We, we have a hard time knowing what does this mean and what do I do with it. And, and the point I want to emphasize is that the first century Christians evidently knew exactly what it meant because it has survived in our canon. It was meaningful, it was important, and it was worth keeping. The, the books of the New Testament make it into our Bible because churches were using them. Like they... they, they they had already discovered these these texts and these letters and all the churches, like the vast majority of churches were seeing them as useful for teaching and for doctrine and for Christian living. We sometimes think of Revelation as this really difficult, scary thing and we don't know what to do with it. But when the earliest Christians got this from John... Their reaction wasn't, well, John has really gone cuckoo on the Isle of Patmos because this makes no sense. It meant something to them. That's just worth us being aware of, thinking about. Still doesn't necessarily help us interpret it, but gives some perspective on how meaningful it was to the first church. I would argue that the book of Revelation is not meant primarily to be a revelation of a timeline of events, but revelation of a person. It's to reveal to us something about the character and the nature of Jesus and to show him as the king who is seated on the throne, the one who is victorious, the one who has fulfilled every promise he has made, the one who is the ultimate um, final chapter of the story that God has been writing since the creation of the earth. It emphasizes his sovereignty, his redemption, and his coming kingdom. Uh, it begins with seven, uh, seven letters to seven churches. These are very practical, and I think if you read those, you find a lot of current day, contemporary, modern application for those. It's after those letters that we get into the vials and the bowls and the trumpets that things start getting a little bit trickier for us to figure out. There are four primary ways to interpret Revelation, to understand Revelation. They are idealist, continuous historical, preterist, and futurist. 
Now, we dive a lot deeper into this in environments like Theology 101, but I'm going to do just a brief skim um, over the surface of context in another group. But at the end of the day, at the end of the story, what we find is Jesus coming and establishing his reign, establishing his rule, declaring, I win. At the end of all things, I win. From the very beginning of time, when creation was set in order, and when the worst thing that could possibly happen happened, and the fall occurred, and God said, one day, your offspring will crush the head of the serpent. And there were these distant glimpses of a Messiah. There were distant glimpses that this story was not over. It had just begun. And when we fast forward all the way to the end, we see exactly that. We see Jesus, who has come, wrapped in the skin of his own creation, subjected himself to the care of his own creation, in order to reestablish connection between God and man, in order to release those who are in bondage to freedom, in order to restore those who feel as though they've been living in exile to relationship. And he sits on the throne, and once again, we find that the story isn't over. It's really just begun. Let me pray for us. God, I I thank you for your word. I thank you for the story that you have given to us. Um, I pray that as a result of our time together that we would just be challenged to dive in more. God, that we would have been confused just enough to have to read more. That our appetite would be whetted just enough that we have to read more. That we would be frustrated just enough that we have to dig into it for ourselves. That we would be encouraged just enough that we would seek to memorize it and bring it close to our hearts. God, ultimately, we would be challenged like those first century disciples that we would take your word and we would make disciples of all nations. That like Paul, we would say the things that we've received, we would pass on to the next generation. And God, that we would live our stories in such a way that it would leave a letter of faith, a record of faith, such that generations who have not yet been born will praise God. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the relationship you have with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I got us. It's nine. It's right at nine. I got us there. Um, Our next uh, semester of small groups starts in two weeks, I believe, a week week and a half. Um, There are several book of the Bible or um, uh, kind of theology-themed groups that would be similar to this. I just encourage you to go to ncc.re slash groups. Um, take a look, and over the next couple weeks at church, we'll be giving more information about that. Thanks again for coming. Appreciate you guys coming out, and I hope you have a great week.